In the 1070s, one could say that the Roman Empire had rock bottom. The reconquests of generations of soldier emperors, along with the heartland of the empire which stood strong against Saracen raids for centuries, all gone in a mere decade. And hyperinflation destabilized the most reliable economy of the Mediterranean since the days of Constantine the Great. Then in a century, the Roman Empire was once again a superpower, and the greatest of all Christian states, and dominating the Mediterranean, from the Balkans to Jerusalem. The 1170s saw Roman power reach its peak one last time, and it is thanks to the Comnenian Restoration that this came to be, which was led by the son and grandson of Alexius Comnenus. The subject of who was the best of the Comnenian has been debated forever, and we hope that by presenting the stories of both Ioannis II and Manuel I Comnenus in full, you will gain a better appreciation and understanding for both emperors. Now, my friend Untold History Animations has kindly offered to narrate to you the reign of Ioannis the Good, so let's welcome him to the stage. When some think of great Eastern Roman emperors, you often think of men like Basil II, Constantine the Great, and Alexios. But rarely do we speak of great men like Ioannis II Komnenos, or his Latinized name, John. A relatively modest emperor, but also an extremely successful one at that. Let us begin our story when he would officially become emperor in 1118, which of course began with complete chaos! His older sister Anna Komnena supported her husband Nikiforos Brienios to reusurp the throne, also supported by their mother Irene, as she didn't like Ioannis very much. But unexpectedly, as water stopped being wet, the sky became red, and the Praetorian guards became loyal, Nikiforos refused to claim the title of Vasileus in fear of civil war. A usurpation foiled as he exposed Anna and Irene to Ioannis before the plot could be made reality. Ioannis would exile Irene to a monastery, and Anna would self-exile to her property, that was almost taken by the way, where she would officially retire to become a historian, writing for example the Alexiad, that would become now our primary source for the First Crusade and the Byzantine perspective on foreign and local affairs in the period. One thing to remember while reading this story is that it was written by Nikitas Honiates a century later, a historian with many biases against female figures of the period, and has very little historical basis. Therefore, we will not go with the evil Irene got bitter and wrote a story to console herself narrative, for example. However, Isakios Komnenos, Ioannis' brother, indeed tried to usurp many times. Now, on with the story. His reign would constantly be tested. Nomadic raids, foreign invasions, political intrigue, you name it. Every summer of his reign was filled with campaigning either into Anatolia against the newly formed Turkish powers like the Rum and the Danishmans, or crusader states like Antioch and Edessa, or protecting his European holdings from barbarian Latins like the Hungarians, Serbs and nomadic steppe people like the Pechenegs. Only in the winter could he address the administration of the empire or handle the political fuckery that took place in the capital. There would simply never be a quiet year for the Vasileus in his 25 year reign, but luckily for us, this man was no pushover. He was as shrewd and calculated as he was pious. The first political move in his reign was bringing in new families that eclipsed men in the imperial court, such as his best friend Ioannis Ashu as Grand Domestic and Head of the Army, and his father's retainers like George Dekanos and Mikhailitsez Stipialiotos to take care of the administration while he was on campaign. The overarching goal of this was to relieve the imperial court from any dominion of a specific aristocratic family such as the Dukids, Diogenes, and even his own family the Komnenoi, so that the political intrigue was kept at a minimum, and glorious conquest for the empire would always be the main objective. And this was rather successful, as the only real conspiracies that emerged in this reign would be by his younger brother Isakios Komnenos, who felt left out from all the privileges, as most of the high position of the empire were taken by competent nobodies instead of brain-dead entitled aristocrats like him. His plot in 1130 will be revealed, Ioannis pardoned him, and as a thank you, he revolted again, and he fled to the Danishmans, never to be heard of again until he was pardoned again by Manuel years later. As a side note, Izakios Komnenos tried to usurp from Manuel as well. When that failed, he built the stunning Theotokos Kosmotoria monastery in Bera, and died a repentant but very butthurt man. Now this would be the only questioning of Ioannis' rule while he reigned, and that's saying something in the world of Byzantium. 
Another aspect of his reign that is important to address is his religious affairs. He wouldn't be as active in theological debates as his father, mainly because he simply didn't have the time, being on campaign and all. But he still found the time to leave the right men in charge to solve ecclesiastical debates and laws, and even tried to find a union between Catholic and Orthodox churches to strengthen East and Western Europe. This attempt to strengthen both churches saw much Latin integration into the empire, even having Latin interpreters working in the imperial court. Latin and Orthodox were in constant quarrel of course, which issues like the filial controversy make both sides extra pissy to each other. Nevertheless, integration was vital to Ioannis' plan to keep the peace between fellow Christians. He would also build many monasteries and churches around his empire, a very recurring building project practiced by the Komnenoi, firstly for political reasons to convert the newly conquered Muslims in Anatolia, but also because he himself was an extremely pious man, taking religion very seriously, even in court or even at the dinner table. His pious nature made him known as the good, for being very moral to not only his subjects but also his enemies, being known to spare his defeated foes and offering favorable terms in the hope to to be more accepted and for the sake of his own piety. But enough about politics, let's start talking about the Romans kicking ass. While Ioannis' military policy was centered around siege warfare and a slow but steady mentality, his rule saw many glorious and triumphant victories. In 1119, he would defeat the Seljuk Turks and retake many cities in Anatolia, such as Atalia, Laodicea, Sozopolis, and many more in two years, now opening future conquests in southern Anatolia and restoring Roman control up to the Taurus Mountains. In 1122, a huge army of migrating Pechenegs would raid into the theme of Baristrion. Even though at this point Ioannis wasn't in Anatolia campaigning against the Seljuk incursions, he rushed to Thrace to crush the horde. The war would culminate at the Battle of Beroya, where the Basilios tricked the Pechenegs leader with a favorable peace and ambushed his army's wagon fort. Funnily enough, a Roman emperor was coincidentally in a very similar position almost eight centuries ago, but unlike Valence at the Battle of Adrianople in 378. Ioannis's generals weren't idiots and his troops were not cowards, as his contingent of 480 Varangians cut through the wagons with sheer ferocity and his cataphracts smashed into the newly made gaps. The Battle of Baroya was such a crushing victory that the Pechenegs would simply cease to exist as a major force for the rest of history after this. Based Chad. Europe wouldn't be done with Ioannis though, as the disgusting Hungarians would enroach on Roman soil. You see, Ioannis was married to the Hungarian princess Piroska, now renamed Irene, and this gave the Romans political leverage over the crown of Hungary. But it will also meant that Ioannis was forced to be part of Hungarian family drama and politics, which is a lot of time that could have been used campaigning in Anatolia, wasted on the Magyar weirdos. Stephen II of Hungary would declare war on Byzantium in 1127, under the claim that Ioannis gave asylum to the blinded Hungarian noble Almos that conspired to take the throne of Hungary. The Kingdom of Serbia would align themselves with Hungary in the war, and the European armies would march into the southern Balkan territories of Rome. The war would last until 1129, as cities would be exchanged over the years, but Ioannis would come out undisputedly on top, as he would conquer the reign of Serbium, capture Belgrade and Branchievo, and many captured Serbs would be displaced into northwestern Anatolia to reinforce Byzantine control in the region. During all this war on land, Ioannis was also conducting wars at sea. Since the beginning of the Crusades and the reign of his father Alexios, the Republic of Venice had been opportunistically dominating the trade routes of the empire and slowly creating an economic monopoly in the Roman market, thanks to a favorable treaty created by Alexios in 1182. Ioannis would attempt to stop this and ban any kind of commerce with the Venetians in 1124. Fun fact, this event has been marked as the very first instance of a trade war in written history, in the sense that there was no direct confrontation, but instead aggressive economical maneuvers. This trade war would last two years until 1127. The Venetians had enough of the Romans, raised a fleet of 72 ships and threatened to sack Rhodes, Lesbos, and captured all their Ionian islands if he didn't renew the 1182 treaty his father made. Ioannis begrudgingly gave in, as this war with the Hungarians and the Serbs needed his attention more than the fruitless war. Poor Ioannis had no idea that giving free reign to the Venetians like this doomed the empire to maritime stagnation and Venetian economic domination, probably one of the only great mistakes, as this decision to give the Italians free reign in the Aegean Sea would be the empire's doom in the future. 
Now with the European borders of the Empire secured, Ioannis could renew conquests in Anatolia. From 1130 to 1135, he concentrated his armies to defeat the Danishmans of Melitene and the Armenian Rubenids, Central and Lower Cilicia. The conquests went so well that he would celebrate a triumph in 1133, after he retook the ancestral Komnenian home of Kastamon. The triumph was on a scale not seen since the days of antiquity. Chariots made of silver, gold and pearls, pulled by bleach white horses with imperial purple saddles. Soldiers of the Tagmata donning bronze celebratory armor marching in the hundreds, monks and priests chanting victory hymns, and finally the emperor himself walking by the side of a mosaic of the Virgin Mary who sat on the chariot while wearing beautiful civilian clothes. The triumph ended at the Hagia Sophia where a procession took place to commemorate the victory to God Almighty. Thanks to his aggressive campaigns, the Turks were completely halted from expansion, even put on the back foot as he would constantly campaign every year without rest. From a diplomatic perspective, and an often forgotten part of the empire, Italy, Ioannis would forge a strong alliance with the Holy Roman Emperor Lothar and the Pope Innocent II in 1137 to counter the continuous rise of the Normans in southern Italy. As we say, never trust those dastardly Normans, even if you have to make up with old enemies. With now the Pope on his side, Ioannis could convince the leader of the Knights Templar, Jocelyn II de Courtenay, to help him in his campaigns in Cilicia, and their aid would be crucial against the Ruben and the Seljuks. Cilicia would swiftly be conquered in 1137, and all of northern Anatolia would also come under the purple flag all the way to Trebizond. From 1136 to 1142, this would be the peak of the reign militarily, thanks to the competent commanders, soldiers, and mercenaries, but more importantly, his tactical perseverance in the face of constant attritional warfare. At the end of his reign, two new themes would be integrated into the empire, Milasa and Melanoidin, a feat unseen since the days of the Bolgar Slayer. The end of his reign would be with the pacification of the Crusader states and perpetual war with the Seljuks. It was the Byzantines who brought these savage Latins in the east, and it would be the Byzantines that put them back in their place. After the Armenian Principality of Cilicia would be conquered, and the Rubenid dynasty turned into Roman hostages, all of the Crusader states would send emissaries to recognize their vassalage to the Basilius without a fight. Ioannis would be pleased, and used these new armies to try and conquer Muslim Syria. Of course, because most of his new armies were Crusader forces, Forces, they were often uncooperative and made things difficult. As the Emirate of Aleppo, the kingdom Ioannis declared war on, hoping to land Latin aid, would prove to be difficult to conquer. As to prove a point by example of how the Latins helped in these wars, the kings of Antioch and Edessa played dice while Ioannis was fighting at the Siege of Shizar in 1138. Not even Latin historians could try and bail those kings out from their pettiness. Even in these circumstances though, great cities like Shizar, Kafartab, and Marat would be conquered by sheer will of the Emperor, proving his martial prowess even with poor allies like the Crusaders. The last years of Ioannis' reign will be fighting the Turks to consolidate Cilicia, and preparing to besiege Antioch itself to finally secure its southern Anatolian gains, because, of course, the Latins would promise to deliver Antioch to him in exchange for new land in Syria, stirred a popular revolt, and drove the emperor from the city, which was already his. Part of this campaign would have included an ambitious pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but sadly, in the early spring of April 1143, he would go out hunting and cut his hand with a poison arrow, getting infected and dying of a few days with his childhood friend Ioannis Ashu at his side. He lived until 55, and after 25 years of glorious rulership, Ioannis Komnenos, in my opinion, was the greatest of his dynasty, as his sheer perseverance and multitasking in military affairs, administration, and religious affairs made him a shrewd emperor at every point of his reign, something that cannot be said for many emperors before and after him. In his final hours of life, something miraculous happened. In his dying breath, he named his fourth son Manuel to be the next emperor. There are many reasons for his last minute decision. First off, Manuel was a son that stayed by Ioannis' side on his campaigns. Being noteworthily brave on certain sieges like at Neo Caesarea in 1140, he was a legitimately competent guy, unlike his brothers like Isakios. There is a legitimately interesting conspiracy theory that entails Crusader Antioch and the upcoming siege of their city. The wimps knew they had no chance, so the Latin mercenaries murdered the emperor and placed his Latinophile son Manuel on the throne to secure their lands and homeland. Okay, we can take off our temple hats now. All of this matters not. All we need to know is that Ioannis is dead, and Manuel is now the official emperor. It's all smooth sailing from here, right? Right?
Who well, guess who's back? Back again, Izakios, here to cause as much mischief as humanly possible. You see, while Ioannis and Manuel were bettering the Empire and furthering its glory, Izakios bid his time in the capital, gathering allies, support, and manpower to further his claim. Manuel rushed as quickly as possible to the capital, having his close companion, Ioannis Ashu, in front to save time, and keeping the death of the Emperor a secret to keep Izakios in the dark. When Ashu made it to Constantinople, he immediately accused Izakios of conspiracy and put him on house arrest. He would then declare the death of Ioannis and Manuel the new emperor of Rome. Manuel would arrive at the capital a few days later, his position finally secured. After the death of Ioannis, a new great ruler had come, and he was ready to bring Byzantium in its third golden age. A wonderful and comprehensive account of Ioannis' life and deeds. Thank you Untold History Animations for your work. People, go check out his channel if you're interested in Eastern Roman, Hellenistic, or more obscure historical topics in general. Now, let us discover the reign of Manuel Comnenus the Great, called the most blessed emperor of Constantinople by the Latins and remembered equally fondly by most Romans, with exceptions such as our main source for this and the next video, Nikitas Coniatis. We already mentioned him for the doubtful story of Anna Komnenos' coup, but his history is highly critical of all emperors after Ioannis, and even though he praises Manuel considerably, he also blames him for quite a bit. This isn't surprising, as Konyatis was writing after the 1204 sack of Constantinople, and, rightfully bitter, he recalls the history of earlier days and seeks to find a cause for the decay of the Roman state. Our modern understanding and criticism of Manuel stem much from Cognatis, but even if most wouldn't call Manuel as the greatest Comnenian emperor, a title frequently given to his father, nobody, modern or medieval, could deny the splendor of Manuel's Roman Empire. In 1143, Manuel was crowned Roman Emperor. The youngest son of Ioannis grew up in the company of his father's Latin contingent, was half Hungarian on his mother Avini's side, and related to the German Emperor by marriage. Who better to tackle the rising Western threats to the Empire than him? First, Manuel continued his father's work on dealing with Antioch. Prince Raymond of Antioch, who organized the riot to avoid delivering Antioch to Ioannis as promised, now had the audacity to ask Manuel to concede Cilician towns to him. He was put back to his place as, in 1144, Zengi de Atebe conquered the county of Edessa. With his east flank exposed and not counting on help to arrive from Europe, Raymond came crying to Manuel begging for help, which the emperor promised to give after thoroughly humiliating the prince at the tomb of Ioannis. But this golden opportunity to reabsorb Antioch back into the empire was ruined by the Second Crusade, the response to the fall of Edessa. In 1145, the Latins began planning a new crusade, this time led by the French king and the German emperor Conrad III. But it wasn't until 1147 that the crusaders arrived. Before that, Count Jocelyn of Odessa, the dice player, held on to the remnants of his county for a while before being decisively defeated by the Zingids in 1146. His wife sold the remains of the county to Manuel, but the Zingids and Rum quickly took over them. Rum had been raiding not only on the new Roman acquisitions, but in the rest of Anatolia as well. So that year, Manuel launched a quick punitive expedition against Sultan Masud. It was during this campaign that Manuel showed all his personal prowess, his valor, his strength, his daring. Also, he could impress the incoming crusaders, but no reconquests were made in Anatolia. The Romans destroyed Philomelion and plundered the countryside of Iconia, but the Second Crusade arrived so he had to rush back to his capital. As much as he admired the Latins, he knew their greed and unpredictability, so he reinforced the walls of Constantinople and took precautions in case the crusaders tried anything funny. Conrad arrived first and even clashed with the Roman troops, unsuccessfully of course, even though the two emperors were family. The French then arrived and were received warmly in Constantinople Then they set off on their merry adventure. Meanwhile, Roger II of Sicily, being a Norman, naturally tried to cause as many troubles for the Romans as possible. His Roman naval commander, Iodius Antiochius, captured Corfu and plundered Greece, sacking as far as Thebes and Corinthia and carrying off many silk workers, which ended the Roman silk monopoly started by Justinian. Conrad fell ill and was sent to recover in Constantinople, where his emperor brother-in-law acted as his personal physician and secured an alliance with him in 1148 against the Sicilian Normans. Now, even the finest of Roman traders was no match for the imperial navy who retook Corfu under Aksu in 1149. Even though the Romans were increasingly reliant on Venetian ships, and the finance minister convinced Manuel to cut the naval budget, the degradation of the imperial fleet was slow. Georgios then tried to attack Constantinople but failed, while Roger stirred the Serbs to invade, aided by the Hungarians. Manuel was undeterred and from 1150 to 1152 he defeated both states, reducing Serbia to vassalage. In 1153, the pro-Hungarian Serbs ousted their leader, but by 1154, Manuel settled the Serbian matter again. Roger died, and the Vasilev saw an opportunity to do a little renovatio, to retake southern Italy, to restore the borders of Rome before massacred. There was a problem. 
Conrad died and his successor, Frederick Barbarossa, was less inclined to help the Romans. So Italy became the contention of the Romans, Germans, Papacy, and Normans. In 1155, the Roman forces under Michael Palaiologos and Ioannis Ducas arrived in Apulia, which was almost reconquered by the end of the year. The southern Italians also helped by revolting against the Normans and welcoming the Romans. Manuel then got Pope Hadrian IV to form an alliance against the Normans in 1156, as the Romans and Papacy had done just before the Great Schism. And the emperor also worked with the Pope to achieve the union of the two churches. We know that never happened, but Manuel was in excellent terms with the Papacy during his reign, and the Italian situation seemed to be in his favor. As the whole coast from Taranto to as far as Ancona was under his control, but then things deteriorated. Palaiologos left the campaign, and as the Romans were besieging Brindisi, the Normans suddenly won a victory, capturing Ducas. Manuel sent Alexios Axu, the son of Ioannis Axu, to Ancona in 1157 to salvage the situation. But the Normans took back all the Roman reconquests, so all Axu could do was negotiate the best peace possible, and the Romans left Italy with their integrity in 1158. Manuel also aimed Ancona as a base in Italy, where Roman influence also increased, and Norman stopped being assholes for the rest of his reign. Although Romans would never again attempt a reconquest of Italy, Manuel continued to participate in Italian affairs and helped the Lombard League resist Barbarossa's attempt to conquer Italy later on. Well, so much for Italy. We will now turn to the east. Manuel personally took up arms and marched through Cilicia down to Antioch, as Thoros, one of the Rubenid captives his father took, escaped and took many Roman forts in Cilicia. In 1156, the Armenians and Latin Antioch kings sacked Cyprus and committed unspeakable atrocities to the Cypriots, which even Latin sources could not hide. Manuel re-established Roman control in Cilicia in 1158, and finally, finally subdued Antioch for good in 1159. When the new prince Reynald heard of Manuel's coming, he knew all was lost. He debased himself before the emperor and begged for forgiveness. Manuel accepted the Antiochian submission and entered the city in triumph. At last, Bohemond's treachery was avenged and Antioch was Roman again. Many games were held, including jousting matches, which the Roman emperor himself participated in, and beat the Latins at their own game. Again, reminding the haughty Latins who was really in charge here. Then Manuel led a Christian army against Nora Dinzingi, who freed 6,000 Christian prisoners, so the assault was cancelled. It's possible that Manuel wanted the Zingids around, so the Crusader states must seek help from and obey him. Satisfied, Manuel returned home, crushing some raiding Turks on the way and retaking Isauria for the empire in 1160. The Romans continued to win victories against the Sultanate of Rome. In 1162, Sultan Kilij Arslan II had to beg Manuel for a peace. The Vasilevs received the Turk in splendor at Constantinople, showering him with gifts and signing a treaty which made Rome a vassal like Antioch. The Sultan would hand Sevastia to the Emperor after conquering it from the Danish Mandate, but ultimately he would not follow the treaty. But for the next decade, Manuel's conflicts with Rome were unimportant, which allowed him to pursue his ambitious projects. In the early 1160s, the Hungarians had a succession crisis, which Manuel got very involved in. The King of Hungary died, and his brother Stephen, who was Manuel's nephew-in-law, was supported by the Vasilevs to the throne in 1163. However, King Stephen IV was defeated by his nephew Stephen III, who promised to give Styrium to the Romans if Manuel stopped supporting his uncle. Suffice to say, the Hungarians broke the word. At the same time, in Cilicia, a possible relative of Stephen, the half-Hungarian Sevastos Constantinos Kalamanos, was named as governor. Thoros was stirring trouble again, but Kalamanos drove the Armenians into the mountains, and then he aided the Crusader states at the Battle of Albuquerque against the Zengids. This was one of the rare instances where Nora Din was defeated, and even rarer was that the Latins were actually grateful to and impressed by the Romans for once. But the next year, the Zengids got their revenge, capturing all those Christian leaders at the Battle of Harim. Although Kalamanos would soon be freed by Nora Din to appease the emperor, in his absence, Cilicia was governed by Alexios Axuk in 1165, then Andronicus Komnenos. Yes, the infamous cousin of Manuel, the future tyrant himself. Earlier, he was involved in a conspiracy against Manuel and imprisoned. He tried to escape many times in the most hilarious ways, but succeeded only in 1165. Then he got a pardon by getting his cousin, the Rus governor of Galicia, to ally with Manuel against the Hungarians, who murdered Stephen IV and were now in full-on war with the Romans. Manuel also named Bella, the brother of Stephen III, as his heir, as he himself had no sons. He renamed Bella as Alexios because of the Ema prophecy. Some fortune tellers told Manuel that the succession of the Comnenian dynasty would be based on the Greek word for blood. That the initials of each Comnenos emperor would, in order, be Alpha, Iota, Mi, and Alpha. So Bella's new name started with Alpha, and the Vasilevs became very suspicious of prominent individuals with such names, like Alexios Axuk and his cousin Andronicus, who were fighting in the Hungarian War. 
After Aksuk and Bela's campaign against Hungary in 1166, Manuel accused Aksuk of treachery in 1167 and exiled him. The Roman Empire lost a capable and loyal commander, but a new one soon arose and became arguably Manuel's greatest general, Andronicus Contostefanos. He won the most important victory of his uncle's reign, the Battle of Sirmium. After thoroughly defeating the Hungarians, the Romans made Hungary cede Bosnia, Croatia, and Dalmatia, essentially the entire Western Balkans. No Roman controlled this much of the Balkans since late antiquity. For this spectacular victory, Conto Stefanos was suitably rewarded with a triumph by Manuel's side. The same year, Manuel intervened in Serbia, whose grand prince Tihomir, a Roman ally, was deposed by his brother Stefan Emania. The Romans came to Tihomir's aid, but Stefan defeated them at Pantina, becoming ruler of all of Serbia and founding the Nemanic dynasty which would play an important role in Roman history later on. Stefan continued to cause trouble for the Romans for a few years, but eventually submitted as a vassal later. Soon the Romans would once more be the overlord of all the Balkans. And now we will turn back to the Crusader states, because Manuel's reign was never dull on any front. The governor of Cilicia in 1166 was Andronicus, who still couldn't lose the responsibility after being pardoned by his cousin. After suffering an ambush by the Armenians and seducing Princess Philippa of Antioch, who was Manuel's new wife, Maria's sister, the playboy was wanted by the emperor for punishment. Andronicus, afraid of his cousin's wrath, fled to Jerusalem in 1167. What did he do there? Continue his wanton behavior and seduce yet another noblewoman, this time his own kin, Theodora Comnini, the widow of the late king of Jerusalem. Manuel immediately issued an order to arrest the licentious bastard, but Theodora warned Andronicus and the two lovers eloped to the east. The new king of Jerusalem, Amalric I, like his predecessor, married the Comnini then concluded a formal alliance with Manuel in 1168 for a grand operation, the conquest of Egypt. Yes, you heard me right. After 500 years, the Romans were planning to come back to Egypt. If the operation succeeded, the Romans would take the Egyptian coast and the Crusaders the interior. But it didn't. Manuel sent Conto Stefanos with 300 Roman ships to Jerusalem in 1169, and the joint fleet besieged Damietta. However, despite Conto Stefanos' best efforts, the Latins failed to cooperate and they all had to sail home. So Manuel leveraged money and gained nothing while the harmless Vatimid Caliphate was further weakened, which may have contributed to its fall in 1171 to Saladin Yusuf ibn Ayyub, or Saladin, the founder of the Ayyubid Sultanate. With the isolated Shia Caliphate replaced by an energetic Sunni state connected to the wider Muslim world, it's no wonder the Kingdom of Jerusalem felt threatened and became independent of the Roman Empire, the only Christian power around to protect the Latins. With Jerusalem as sort of a vassal, Roman control extended back to Palestine for the first and last time, if only for a short time. Remember how Ioannis II tried to deprive the cocky Venetians of their trade privileges? Manuel now tried the same, as their arrogance and dominance over the Roman economy needed to be curbed. In 1171, all Venetians in the empire were arrested. There was outrage back in Venice over the mass arrest, so war broke out. The doge led the Venetian fleet to raid the Aegean Islands, but Conto Stefanos counterattacked in 1172 and drove them back so quickly and a plague killed so many Venetian sailors that the doge was lynched to death by angry mobs back in Venice. The Venetians may have lost this war, but this left deep resentments between them and the Romans, and they weren't the only ones who had quarrel with the empire. Hungary and Serbia tried to join this anti-Roman endeavor as well, but Stephen III died and Manuel, now having a son of his own, supported his ex-heir Bela to the Hungarian throne. King Bela III then promised to be a faithful vassal of the Romans and Stefan Emania also spent it as a vassal since he was left without the allies. The empire once more triumphed over its foes and in the mid-1170s, the Comnenian restoration reached its peak. The whole of the Balkans was under Roman sway, Venice was humbled, Rome and the Crusader states were Roman vassals, yes. This was the state of the Roman Empire in 1173. There was reason for optimism, but if the Romans knew how quickly they would fall from their fortunes in three mere decades, perhaps Manuel's achievements seem much less impressive given how short-lived they were. But this is where we will leave the narrative for today. On a happy note, something in short supply for the Romans after massacred. Those three decades of misery we will leave for the next time. Manuel Comnenos is a difficult character to assess. I have painstakingly formed the concise as possible narrative of his reign as he achieved so much in so little time, but on the other hand it's impossible to not wonder how much he contributed to the collapse of the empire just two decades after his death. He left the empire perhaps wealthier than any time after the 7th century. His domination, although a more soft power approach, over the Mediterranean made him worth to bear the title of Imperator Romanorum, but at the same time, his Latinophilia caused resentment among his Roman subjects and the Latins didn't change their views on the Romans either, continuing to slander them once the emperor was dead. 
Manuel came the closest to reconciliation between the Latins and Romans, but ultimately even this incredible emperor failed. He won allies with his personal prowess and charisma, and virtually all the Roman vassals would feel rid of their obligation after the Vasilev's death. I mean, what respect could his 11-year-old son command? Manuel failed to ensure the survival of the empire after a capable emperor died, but this was a wider problem with the communion system begun by Alexius I. The centralization of power into the hands of one extended family wouldn't help new talents very much. Still, I think we in modern times tend to judge him a bit too harshly and easily dismisses every project which wasn't in Anatolia as overly ambitious and unrealistic, vainly chasing a dream of restoring the long-gone empire of old. A similar critique which many throw at Justinian the Great. It should be no surprise then that the successors of Manuel the Great followed a similar pattern to that of Justinian, but we are getting ahead of ourselves. Manuel was not dead yet. Please join me next time as we finish the rest of his reign and that of the Communion Dynasty and the collapse under the Angeli. Thank you for watching.